Hello lovelies. Today I will share with you the second installment of our mini series is the human race under spiritual attack. And for this we will spend some time with the work of John Lamb Lash mythologist, writer, educator, and Taoist monk who writes widely about Gnosticism, astronomy, and pre-Christian mysteries. His book, Not in His Image, has been described as world-changing. And if you know his work already, there'll be nothing new for you to hear. So you can say, see ya! If you do not know the work of John Lamb Lash, this should be interesting. And I will add that John is also known for some controversial ideas. So this is my disclaimer. If you listen to more of him, be discerning. And it is always a good measure to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I had someone unsubscribe last week <laughs> because I used a clip of Russell Brand, but I would not have used the clip if his words were not useful and insightful. So can one be skeptical about someone and still value their words? I can, and I think it has its advantages. Truth does not always come in pretty perfect packages. And I certainly do not agree with everything anyone says, period. I pick and choose. Well, back to John. A big part of his contribution to our gnosis is the fallen goddess scenario. This narrative explains the cosmic origins of life and human purpose on Earth. In John's opinion, no other narrative explains the ultimate truth about evil and how it works against all that is good in our precious world. I think it is a cohesive narrative. John explains that due to its exceptional message, this narrative has been attacked, distorted, maligned, and suppressed more violently and more continuously over the centuries than any concept in all of history. And that may be because it also is the creation myth of the Archons. How and why they exist, what they are up to, and I'm guessing they wish to keep that under wraps. But possibly it could also be because the Gnostics worshipped the divine feminine. The Gnostics had a vision story, and the central figure in this story was a goddess called Sophia. The myth of the fallen goddess is beautiful and unique, and John believes he's the only scholar of Gnosticism to completely restore the story out of the fragments found in the Nag Hammadi discovery. John's work is an interpretation of the Nag Hammadi texts themselves developed over many generations by the Magian Order, M-A-G-I-A-N, hmm, a community of visionary teachers. The Magians were the pagans, pre-Christian forerunners of the Gnostics. They called themselves Telestai, those who are aimed, aimed towards intimate access to the intelligence of the living earth, the Telluric Matrix. In their united dedication to the sacred narrative of Sophia, they revised and preserved this story over many generations. The fallen goddess scenario is a story about a goddess on a galactic scale. Sophia is an aeon, a power existing from eternity, an emanation or phase of the supreme deity. John says that she and all other aeons are massive serpent torrents of energy that swim and dance in the middle of the galaxy. Their passion is creation, so they spend their time designing life forms and seeding them throughout the galaxy. In this story, Sophia created humanity inside the galactic center. She was to seed it within the limbs of the galaxy to watch the experiment unfold. Still, Sophia became so fascinated by her experiment that she did something that she wasn't supposed to do. As a result of her obsession, she ventured out of the galactic center and as a result got entangled in the laws of materiality. This entanglement in the material substance was the nature of her fall. And what was created by her entanglement in matter was actually the earth. Her life force and consciousness got tangled up in the earth itself. 
And this was an anomaly. Interestingly, John says that scientists have found evidence of a stellar spike of plasma emanating from the galactic core, at the end of which Earth evolved. He wonders has scientists discovered the evidence of Sophia's fall. There was a secondary event, however. The discharge fall of Sophia created an enormous impact on the third arm of the galaxy within universal matter, and this created an enormous disturbance. As the matter plasma goo crystallized, it produced a buzzard species of insectoid creatures. The Gnostics called these creatures archons. Now again, John has some more scientific evidence for how this might have been possible. John points to an experiment in 1830 where a British scientist named Andrew Cross, with an E, created life in a lab. While pursuing some investigations on electrocrystallization, what he called Acarus insects miraculously appeared out of the ether under conditions usually fatal to animal life. John wonders if this is akin to the creation of the Archons. Anyway, the Archons are described as an extraterrestrial entity that is cyborg in nature and parasitic and predatory to the human species. Sophia, realizing she'd made a mistake by creating them, granted them the power to organize their own habitat. So they created what John calls the inorganic solar system, Mercury, Venus, Mars, etc. And she made rules about them not interfering with Earth which they have ignored. The organic solar system, by contrast, consists of a trinity, the sun, moon, and earth, that all work together in natural rhythms. Now, back to the archons. Apparently, they cannot physically travel to Earth as oxygen is toxic to them, but they can impinge on Earth telepathically and implant deviant ideas within the human mind. These implants are described as a foreign installation in the human mind-body system. Hmm, have we heard of that before? Archons are also described as the guardians of the threshold and the teachers of the mystery schools knew the passwords that allowed us to avoid them and gain access to other spheres and go beyond them in the afterlife. Many of the things that the archons do are just simulations. They are not real until we make them real. Doesn't that ring a bell? And if we allow them to lure us into simulation, then we will fail at reaching our human potential. And so John believes that one of the most important messages to come out of the Gnostic teachings is for us to discern what really enhances human potential and what leads us to simulation. In the Pista Sophia, which is a fragmentary text, there appears to be evidence that Mary Magdalene received a transmission after the death of Jesus, that she was able to do this very thing, to use passwords to surpass the Archon influence. In this document, it describes the various aspects of the astral world and how to traverse them by facing the archons. The Nag Hammadi also teaches psychic and self-defense, the use of magical mantra and mudras in order to repel the influence of these archons. We, as part of the biosphere, are required to become conscious of what we are in order to help Gaia or Sophia, escape her bondage. But we will only do that by going deeper into communion with the earth herself. You see, we have two systems on this planet. One system of organic rhythms, rhythms that come from the earth itself, the moon and the sun, and another set of systems and rhythms that come from the archons. The archons use mental manipulation to create a mindset that takes us away from the organic system, from the natural rhythms that surround us. 
In fact, John believes that the Archon manipulation would not even work on us if we were able to return to natural rhythms like the indigenous peoples of the planet. I wonder why they have been targeted. I have included below a list of the links to John's numerous websites if you would like to learn more about this. And there are several interviews out there that he has done that get more into the Egyptian magic side and the UFO side. And there is a lot that he has to say about the three main Abrahamic religions in that they are precisely the type of mental manipulation that the archons have implanted within our psyche. But it's something to think about. And what I'm trying to do in this mini-series is to give you some jigsaw puzzle pieces that possibly will fit together at the end of it all so that we can get a sense of whether we are, in fact, being influenced by outside sources. Next, I think we will go and look at the work of Cliff High and his story of the bug. And then we'll whip it around and come back and look at the locust people. Some more information by Rudolf Steiner. And I think by the end of those, unless anyone else has something to suggest, we might have a good feeling for what it is that we are up against. Unless I can convince a young man to doing an interview with me and he holds another piece of the puzzle but we'll keep that one a secret for now thank you for listening lovelies and if you like this podcast and would like to support us please go to magicalegypt.com and i have made a special discount coupon just for you all and the coupon code is love And that will get you $30 off any Magical Egypt purchase. Also, um, I've started a Patreon, so you can mosey on over there and uh, see if you want to contribute. But I appreciate you listening and I appreciate all your support. And more soon. Bye.